Hello, everyone. Welcome to the return of the Translation Colloquium held by the Center of Research and Innovation in Translation and Translation Technology here at Kent State University. Um, today, we have a special guest, Dr. Uh, Miguel Bernal Marino, uh, with a talk entitled Playability and Game Localization Creative Interactivity. Uh, Dr. Miguel is a senior lecturer in the Department of Media, Culture and Language in Rome University. He is also a senior lecturer at the Center of Research in Translation and Transcultural Studies and a senior lecturer in the Hispanic Research Center. Um, Dr. Miguel researches the localization of multimedia interactive entertainment software and audiovisual media translation. His research is original and multidisciplinary, and it keeps expanding the discipline of translation studies beyond its traditional limits. He is the author of Translation and Localization in Video Games, Making Entertainment Software Global, published by Routledge. Um, he created the main international forum for the discussion of professional video game localization at the core of the game development industry and the software localization sector. Um, his publications have had a very positive impact on professional practice and he is regularly called upon as a private consultant by company across Europe. Um, we want to thank him again on behalf of the student body and faculty here at Kent State uh, for making the time to talk to us today. Uh, and without further ado, the floor is yours, Dr. Miguel. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. And, I've, and um, yes, uh, I'm very glad to be talking about this topic because, uh, well, obviously, it's uh, one of my passions together with uh, the localization and cultural adaptation of any other media. Uh, be it uh, literature or, or comics or films uh, or theater, actually, even musicals. Uh, so let me just jump into uh, the presentation. And then I'll try to make it uh, short or kind of. And then you can um, ask me further uh, to expand in any, any one direction that you may want. So playability and game localization, enabling creative interactivity. Um, tries to take the, the topic of translating uh, something, which we normally do in translation studies. Uh, typically, we focus on text translation, which makes sense because it originated with translation of religious texts. And then uh, why wouldn't you focus on text, obviously? Uh, but then um, the interactivity of video games, uh, being software, actually brings something new. And uh, I, I am a, a fan and a, a beginner in the research of of neural networks and, and the brain, how the brain works and makes sense of the world. So I was wondering what, what happens, what is it different when uh, you uh, translate just a word or when you have that same word in a video game and actually by doing something in the game, you get a different meaning or, or a bigger dimension to that meaning. So that's what I wanted to explore here and that's what I tried to do in my, in my research. So I'm, I'm lucky that I got into this research at the very beginning. So basically, I've been collaborating uh, with anybody who uh, would be interested, uh, whether it is industry, academic, uh, or, or trade fairs, or any, any of the aspects of, of this research, professionally, academically, and uh, notionally. Uh, I'm a creator myself. I like writing. Uh, I like poetry. I like creating. I like uh, drawing, design, I like sculpture and singing. Uh, so all of this for me, it's, um, it's linked. And obviously, because I do travel quite a fair amount, like many of you probably do, uh, I do notice differences, uh, which I think can be improved on. So this is what I say, uh, do what you love and share your passion. Uh, this is what I try to do all the time. So the takeaways from this seminar is Video games combine most of the characteristics of previous media into an interactive artifact uh, that harnesses all the capabilities of the computer age. In this sense, traditional creativity difficulties intertwine with the interactivity that attracts players, players to these uh, most immersive media. Now, I think semiotics and pragmatics do offer robust analytical tools to study this layering of meaning making assets in multimedia interactive entertainment software. And uh, I will explain why the concept of playability is essential to determine 
the quality of video game localization as expected in the industry. I'm probably going to be throwing uh, quite a lot of terms around. Um, if you find that overwhelming, just ask me at the end. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I've been using them for so long, uh, they seem normal, but maybe uh, for you, they're not, depending on what your background is. Uh, I'm happy to answer anything, so just, just ask away, you know. The only silly question is the silly, the question of whether to ask, always ask. So anyway, selling products abroad is always challenging, and uh, as lucky people like us, who are multilingual and multicultural, do travel a lot, we do notice differences, right? So this is near... Um, and this is the Japanese and the American version, one having a, a more teenage protagonist and another having more an older buffer protagonist. That was the American Western version. Uh, you may also know this one, uh, this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. So these are all media products, video games, cartoons, uh, movie uh, feature films, uh, Disney products uh, like this one. This is from Up. And even TV programs uh, following the, the premise of uh, TV formats. This is, in particular, this is the series, BBC series, uh, Dancing with the Stars, which actually has been broadcast, in, I think, in more than 50 territories with their own uh, particular type of adaptation. So uh, when you localize or when you translate, there's always people like us that focus, that come from traditional uh, language studies, translation studies, we always focus on what to translate. And this is just an interesting example that illustrates uh, the core of many of the challenges. So this is, as you probably recognize, is a very small section from The, the Hobbit, uh, written by uh, Tolkien in the 37, published in 37. Um, and then we have here some different translations of those names. Names and words were very, very important for Tolkien talking himself, being a, a linguist, a translator, an expert in Nordic, uh, Nordic languages, etc. And he actually got involved in the translation of his books. Uh, and this is interesting because we have here uh, the two Spanish versions, one uh, done in Mexico, one done in Spain at uh, different years, which actually bring out a, a very interesting topic. How do you actually translate a name? Uh, if that name has a meaning or not. So you have here the French, Bilbo Sake, uh, the hobby Bilbo Beutlin in German, Baggins in English, uh, Bolshon in Spanish, or Baggins in the other version. Uh, I don't know Russian, so apologies for that, uh, but it seems to say uh, Beutlin. Uh, anyway, so this is our something that a translator will always worry and spend sleepless nights about, and rightly so. Uh, it's very enough that this is the case. Now, these issues will come up in video games and in any other creation. But there are many linguistic layers that give meaning, right? So we have the lexical layer, right? What is the difference between shaken, not mixed, as opposed to shaken, not stirred? Why would anyone care? Well, uh, if you like James Bond, you probably used to shaken, not stirred. And uh, it's slightly different from shaken, not mixed. And that's a lexical choice. In the syntactic layer, uh, you may recognize this. There's a difference between you still have much to learn to much to learn you still have. That comes from Star Wars. This is Yoda speaking. That's the syntactic layer changing. The phonetic layer. Uh, he must not hurt precious as opposed to he must insert precious, which comes obviously from the Lord of the Rings, Gollum speaking. And as you notice, this is actually the uh, adequate misspelling as written by Tolkien, uh, extending the S so that the reader actually gets the hissing noise uh, or the voice of Gollum. And then you also have the uh, morphologic layer. Uh, what's the difference between saying magnific or saying strumfic, which is uh, what um, the Smurfs, uh, if you like reading the, Smith, the Smurfs, the comic books, uh, they say um, in, uh, in the original, uh, Dutch, French um, uh, version. So uh, these differences will always be the, 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 um, the focus of people who do text translation only. And this appears in any, every media project, actually. So the translation of natural and in dialogues is common across media. This is 
an example from um, the video game uh, Nathan Drake. Uh, there you go. I four. Finish it? Yeah. Oh. Right, so the, it, nowadays you can find different, many places on the internet actually, but you can find this. And you have. A stukje over toerisme in Bangkok, maar. You have the English, you have the German. Le solite cose. Dimmi del tuo articolo. Allora. Era nato come un articolo leggero. Right. And that's fantastic. Uh, and that, in order for that translation to work, uh, it needs to be well translated. It needs to be translated for orality. It needs to sound natural. And then the dubbing actors, the voiceover actors, need to be actually on the ball and make it sound natural, just like any other uh, product. But this apply, applies also to, to films, right? So that is not new in video games. Now, those are neither new not the only issues or the only challenges. This is another example from uh, the old uh, story um, of uh, many of you may know Heidi. Uh, this is a Disney version uh, of the actual original book, a German book, uh, German-Austrian, uh, that goes uh, back a couple of centuries. And this is the Japanese anime version of it that maybe some of you watched when they, you were kids. So each of these versions, each of these translations require different things different attention. Some of it will be attention to text, some of it will be attention to image or a combination of it, right? So you have a comic book, uh, there will say something um, unique to that translation of comic book that differs slightly from the novel or from the film. Um, these are very ex popular example. If you haven't read Asterix and Obelix, uh, you should. Uh, it's brilliant and they already are dealing with translation of naturalness, translation of songs and music, and this is a lovely example this is the original French, and this is you have the English, and then you have the Spanish here, and you have the German here, and these all are adequate. And, and you can say, why do they change the font size, uh, the type of um, other diacritics and other symbols that they put on the vignette, on the little um, boxes? And it's because they convey meaning, right? So graphic media added to the translation challenges of literature. And then the early movies actually did have intertitles and did have dubbing. So that's another thing for you to go check if you haven't yet. Uh, if you think you don't like black and white films, uh, I would challenge you to go watch a few of them because they are quite brilliant. These are very uh, uh, excellent example, uh, Lauren Hardy, uh, very, very popular. And they themselves did several international films, uh, international versions, excuse me, uh, where they themselves would speak the dialogues in all the languages. They're brilliant and very brave too. So in this case, uh, they would actually speak in English, but then they would speak in Spanish, then they would speak in, they did the same film. They had recorded it three times. Those are international versions and there were quite a few of those. Uh, I do recommend that you do check those. It's, they're brilliant. Uh, even TV programs, like Sesame Street, uh, many of you may be aware of it and still being broadcast. And Sesame Street started from very early on with a model of co-creation. So Sesame Street producers in the US would go to each of the countries and actually help local producers and the local creative team to create an expansion of Sesame Street content, some of which will be uh, unique to that particular country and some of it will be, will be coming from the internationally shared library of Sesame Street materials. Uh, typically, each country has a puppet or a muppet that is unique to them. So that's a way of doing translation, localization, and co-creation together. Very interesting topic. Uh, you have, for example, for, I think it was for South Africa, a puppet, a muppet called Kami. It's a puppet especially designed to talk to children about um, the pandemic of uh, AIDS at the time. So all these things have ways of uh, translating or localizing media products. You also have uh, the music industry that employs uh, localization principles to do uh, their own translation. So I don't know, you probably know Holly Wallens and you know the, the version of uh, the song Kiss Kiss, but that was originally a Turkish uh, song by this gentleman, Tarkan, called Simarik in Turkish, uh, which is brilliant actually. So 
the music industry has also been utilizing and thinking about this. How do we make this product more appealing to other countries? Or if you want to be cynical, how do we get more money out of this main creation? By tweaking the creation a little bit, uh, they do do that. In this case, probably it's more extreme because it's a different singer. And actually, it's a different language. And actually, they, they change a fair amount the lyrics. But anyway, very interesting topic to research. So what's new in video games? In video games, the meaning flows between user and products in a bidirectional bi way. Meaning, when you read a novel and when you watch a film, basically, uh, the message is there. There's uh, basically five layers of meaning, which I look into now. And there are 15 types of sign that can be there, as according to traditional semiotic uh, disciplines uh, research. And then the reader or the viewer will understand or not understand, uh, but continue reading or continue watching. In the game of games, in the game of the video game, a video game is a game machine. There's nothing magical about uh, a video game. A video game is basically a, a, a machine that has virtual buttons. You click here, you click there, you press this button, and the story continues, or the story stops, and then there's no more game. Uh, if you fail to understand what's going on, you cannot continue that game. Uh, and it's not only a question of you know, killing all the zombies on the screen, it will be a question of the dialogue, the narrative, the, what is being communicated by that game, how the messages are phrased, how many layers of that particular message are being used, the signs that need to be changed for each of the versions, and whether the player or not receives that. So maybe the original American game or the original American target audience player would be okay with it because, yeah, we share the language, we share the culture, we share all the common uh, background, no problem there. But the moment you start changing things when you go to another country, if you only change a few words in the menu, or a few words in the subtitles, some of the message and some of those layers are going to stay in English while some of them are going to be translated to the target language. And that becomes problematic. It becomes problematic because what could be or should be uh, the game machine has one meaning, then it is, yeah, it has one meaning, but it's a variation what it gets to, you know, language uh, localization version two, localization version three, because some of those layers are not being conveyed specifically for that particular market. Uh, that sounds a bit complex, so let's look into it. Now, a video game has different layers of communication or layers of semiosis, semiosis as in the traditional semiotic uh, theory. So a video game will communicate with the player by written text, by spoken language, by uh, written language, so voiceover and uh, text on the screen, will communicate with the players uh, through music uh, that may have lyrics or not. So maybe songs, but just maybe music. And music itself, even if it, if it does not have lyrics, communicates something, right? It's different to, to listen to Wagner, to listen to Chopin, or to listen to Kitaro, who is a, a Japanese uh, new age music artist. It communicates through sound, special effects, you know, walking, shooting, flying, uh, whatever. It communicates by touch if the uh, controller vibrates or not. Uh, that is telling you, the player, something. It communicates by proprioception, in particular if you are using, obviously, one of those 3D um, hel helmets or goggles, um, because as you move your head, you get the impression of being there, you're being in the world. That is called proprioception, the perception of yourself inside the world. And equilibrioception, if you've been to one of these big uh, video game arcades, you can jump into one of these cabins where you can simulate uh, flying uh, a plane, uh, you know, or a spaceship, or, or, or you can ride on a bike, actually a bike, or, or, or go skiing uh, down the slopes of whatever. You actually get into the um, a cabin of this game, and the whole thing moves with you, or you move with the whole thing. Uh, that is equilibrioception. Your body tells you whether you are standing uh, firm as uh, gravity demands, or if you're tilting to one place or tilting to the other. So all those layers of communication are there. You, your brain is aware of it. It's not only written language and it's not only spoken language. 
Now, some of these will need to be uh, altered, modified in some manner when you are doing video games because some of them carry meaning that is essential. Oh. Every asset that carries meaning within multimedia interactive entertainment software must pass a pragmatic appraisal. And pragmatic meaning uh, what is the use of that particular word, phrase, expression, movement, gesture, uh, grimace, what is the use of that in real life? That would be a pragmatic appraisal, as well as semiotic one. So how is that sign normally used, again, in real life, in that particular community, not in the community of origin, or at least in the community of the video game, which may be different from the community of the developers and the community of the target audience player, because they are uh, their own game, right? Each, each narrative, each video game creates its, its own logic. So the logic in uh, uh, World of Warcraft is different to the logic of Halo or the logic of Super Mario Bros, right? So during the process of localization, the immersion and interactivity provides is at risk of being broken. So if some of these layers are modified and some of them are not modified when they, need, uh, when they were necessary, then the communication is broken. The immersion is broken. So the interactivity becomes less fluid. Uh, if it comes to a point where the player is at a loss, doesn't know what to do, and that's not the point, or that's, that was not intended, that is a mistake, basically, of the development team, of the design team, or of the localization team. Uh, so let's see a bit of that. Now, this is a very complex table that I write about in, in one of the articles. Uh, but basically, there are essential uh, neural networks. And I, I refer to neural networks because, as probably many of you will know, uh, the brain has, uh, has been divided in many functional areas that tend to deal more with uh, syntax, more with sound, more with movement, more with emotion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I'm, I'm appealing or, or I'm making use of this uh, network to, to say or to explain that each of them is there for a reason. Uh, they, they're not redundant. They are there because they are useful for something and they're useful because they um, help us have a better, fuller uh, understanding of the world around us. Now, the world in a video game is very much more simple. It will always be the case. The world in a video game is very simple, but still, because there is interactivity there, and um, hence this pragmatic elicitation uh, aspect of it, because of this pragmatic elicitation, we immediately know, oh, that's not normal, that's not logic. Well, if I can open this door, why can I not open that door? Oh, it's just a graphic, or oh, it's just a texture, or oh, it's just decoration. If I can pick up this object, why can I not pick up that object? If I can jump, jump this rock, uh, why can I not jump this table, right? Sometimes many games have inconsistencies. Now that applies to all the versions, eh? but sometimes those inconsistencies that are pragmatic, that is something you need to interact with, are inconsistencies that may affect the localization because they need changing or they need uh, modifying in some manner. So let's look at uh, some examples from video game. Uh, mutual comprehension between uh, players and game machines, uh, whoever is using the game and whatever the game is, whether it's a console, uh, a mobile, a smartphone, a uh, PC game, uh, Mac game, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe some, some of you will know this, this is from Batman. And there are many uh, riddles like this. So in this case, let's see if uh, this works decently. Okay, let me just make this bigger. So this is, if you like Batman, you know one of the enemies of Batman is the Riddler. And the Riddler naturally makes riddles for Batman, which is a bit silly really, thinking tough Batman answering riddles, but never mind. Uh, the point is this, this, little bit of game, gameplay, requires uh, interactivity in the actual uh, translation of the words. And depending on how you translate those words, this thing will work or not. So have a look, so have a listen. Tell me 
see this. If you know me, you'll want to share me. But if you share me, I'll be gone. What am I? Right. So, what am I? I'm a secret. If you share me, I'll be gone. I'm a secret. Okay. Uh, so, that obviously was translated uh, into many languages. And here you have, for example, the Spanish version uh, of another uh, example with uh, mirror and spiegel or uh, what's the other one? Espejo. Okay. So, if you imagine, okay, when, when you see this as a player, it's like, well, yeah, so what? What was the big issue there? All right. But now you need to think, if you know a little bit about computing, about programming, about websites, um, a program, just like a website or a PowerPoint or a browser, internet browser or a video game, they have thousands, if not millions of lines of code to create the illusion of interactivity. And in entertainment, the interactivity serves the purpose. <laughs> okay, is that me? No, I don't know. I don't think that was me. Okay. So um, the the video game is going to uh, have to archive or, or register or uh, record the different options in the game code. Millions of lines of game code. So how would you uh, store words and how would you store store words that are divided into two in order to create this illusion so basically actually everything that comes into a game is normally exported by the localization engineer into a tables typically excel sheets excel tables with hundreds thousands uh, hundreds of thousands of lines collecting the words in the menus, the words in the tutorials, the words in the voiceover, the words in the um, subtitling, uh, the captions. Um, so that in itself is already quite difficult because a translator would only receive the actual um, Excel sheets. A translator of video games, even if they are working in the developing company, normally they are uh, outsourced but even if they were working in the developing company very often the translators do not have access to the game maybe the game has not even been finished so translators that only have access to those little words in those table in those tables in excel sheets that makes the whole uh, enterprise very very difficult now you have um uh, as well as text, you have songs and riddles, just like that. And in some cases, the songs are just part of the of the ambient of the game. So this is from The Witcher, for example. These girls long have yearned for your tender caress. Right, and that song actually was, if you play The Witcher, uh, you played in different languages. That song has been translated and sung by other artists in other languages. Uh, that's all right. In that case, the translation, well, the, the, the song and the lyrics are relevant to the storyline because uh, Priscilla, in this case, had a relationship with, with the witcher. Uh, you could say it's not fundamental. It's part of the ambient. Okay, maybe. Um, nevertheless, you have other examples in that game, like this one, which is the riddle uh, of the magic lamp. And depending on the riddle, uh, that there is an interactivity there. What was that inscription again? Four guardians, four flames, standing proud in a line. First, to light his fire, dared not march on the end. The second... Right, so there's a whole poem, a whole rhyme, and depending on that... And thus they stood over their queen. The player needs to go the different statues and activate them. Mm, lit up like a charm. Right? So the translation of those words, the translation of that riddle, would be uh, quite important for the interactivity. If the translation is not adequate, it wouldn't work. And then finally, this example that is quite popular, maybe you've seen it before. This is from obviously uh, Monkey Island, case of Monkey Island, where you are a pirate. And you actually need to choose 
uh, particular lines and the other characters will sing to that to rhyme it. Come on, men. We've got to recover that map. That pirate will be done for when he falls into our trap. Okay. So what, what, what I'm going with all this is the interactivity itself depends on the, trans the adequate translation of those words, those lines, those riddles. And the fun, in the case of Monkey Island, for example, is supposed to be a funny game. Um, it should be also silly and funny. So all of that needs to be in the translation of that. And by all means, you could focus only on the translation of text, but uh, the translation of text needs to be linked to the interactivity, the playability of it. So this bidirectional workflow uh, for the localization of multimedia interactive entertainment software uh, was actually picked on uh, not so long ago, to be honest. Um, this is a quote from uh, Bill Barnes uh, during a conference at uh, GDC uh, a few years ago during the localization summit. And he said, well, for us, English is not a special case. English is just another language, although English is the original. Localization professionals, we need to think beyond just translation and start acting as the voice of the global interest within our teams. So the game needs to play just as well in other languages as it does in English. That makes perfect sense. And it is not that the previous people did not know it, uh, is that probably that the, uh, the market uh, wasn't as matured as, as it was at that point. So because this is a conversation between the player and the game machine, conversational maxims uh, do apply. Conversational maxims do apply to guarantee playability. Uh, this is another example from Assassin's Creed um, uh, where the actual translation of the text uh, applies also corresponds to the logic of the game and the mm, topography of the game and the architecture of the game. So let's see if these links work. Uh, maybe some of you have played this. Right, so in this case, you go around the building, you, you've read uh, Assassin's Creed, uh, you, you know this one, and eventually you find uh, little um, notes and, and riddles around the uh, buildings or the locations, and then you need to go and find the solution for that, find the other um, icon or symbol. In this case, that riddle takes you to the very top of the tower where you complete the riddle. So the translation of that riddle needs to link up somehow or make it clear enough for the player that you're going to need to climb up the tower of the building and find the other uh, symbol, the, the magical um, glitch. Now that is something that doesn't happen even when you have riddles and glyphs in other media, literature, comics, films. Uh, your not understanding that would not stop the book, would not stop the film. In this case, for games, it would stop the games. So the conversation uh, has failed and the maxims are not being um, done correctly, maybe because the translator didn't get the meaning. And it didn't get, the translator didn't get the meaning not because it was a bad translator, but maybe because the translator didn't have enough information. If you're just translating a few words from an Excel sheet from a table, uh, it's difficult to get all the meaning. So, uh, players, players have a foregrounding of belief. Uh, and I say that as, as opposed to the suspension of disbelief. Players want to believe in this world, right? When you are playing a Batman game, you want to believe that for those minutes or hours, you are Batman. That world makes sense. And there is someone called the Joker. And there is someone called the Riddler. And you uh, fight with them in the various different and picturesque uh, ways. So multimedia interactive software offers players a product that can, during localization, see the internal cohesion of its mini-making layers broken because the right neural networks are not triggered. So some of the words have been translated, but some of the other meaning carried in the other semiotic layers are not being carried over. Interactivity adds a semi-pragmatic firewall, if you will, 
So only quality localization that maintains that playability, playability that's as fluid in the original as in the localized versions, uh, so only this type of localization can be successful. The right neural networks are uh, expert, if you want. Players experience a foregrounding of belief. If I'm playing uh, Mario Worlds, that is the logic that apply, you know, jumping on top of the mushrooms will kill the mushrooms. Now, if I jump on top of an enemy while playing Call of Duty, uh, probably I'll be the one dying. So the logic of the world is king. That's why I mean, uh, that's what I mean with foregrounding of belief. Whatever the logic of the world is, if it is cohesive, I buy into it. I believe it is no problem. Just like if I'm playing My Little Pony, or, um, you know, Barbie, My Little Pony, whatever, whatever. That is the logic. Anything else is irrelevant. If the localization only looks at words, just like words on a novel, something is probably going to go wrong. Players want to believe in this world and its possibilities for the duration of the game. It is actually this contrast that provides part of the amusement by comparison with their daily lives, right? We know that uh, you don't shoot at people, that you don't run over people uh, like you do in Grand Theft Auto. Uh, or if you are playing Need for Speed, uh, you're not gonna stop because there is a shop there and you're going to go in to, to buy a beer. Uh, it's a driving game. That's what you do, you drive. So um, players want to believe whatever the fantasy is that the player, that the game is selling. Uh, here's a couple of uh, suggestions for you if you don't know them. Uh, scribble, scribble notes. Uh, this is a very interesting thing that you can study if, if you haven't looked at it yet. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but Scribble Notes Unlimited UK, uh, there's apparently, or there was a recall during to the lack of a UK English version because originally it only had the US version. Uh, eventually they did do a UK version of it. It was quite interesting. And if you don't know this game, you should have a look and actually play it because it's brilliant. It's called Typo Man. And like you can imagine, it's, um, well, it's a typo. So it's all involved with words. Uh, so how would you localize that and see how the translation of a single word, sometimes even letters, would be affected by changing languages? Fantastic game a brilliant platformer, a beautiful headache for localizers. Uh, I don't think that that one was um, localized. So anyway, uh, that is my main message. Uh, I prefer you to ask me some more questions. This is my the basic bibliography uh, and sources that you could uh, go look for more details uh, with the concepts I, I touched upon and I used. And uh, that's basically me. Uh, you can find me, that's my email. Uh, at university and you can also find more information about me obviously in my main uh, Roehampton University uh, webpage which is the one where I have all the research etc etc and uh, that's it so happy to answer any questions uh, please let me know um, thank you Dr. Miguel for this very interesting talk uh, uh, so now uh, I'll open the floor for anyone who has a question for Dr. Miguel. Um, you can either type the uh, question in the chat box or you can uh, press the raise hand button and um, uh, uh, have the mic and uh, ask your question directly to Dr. Miguel. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Uh, come on. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So I, d I do have one uh, specific question. I think you touched on a little bit um, specific. The 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 quote from the localization lead of Blizzard is really interesting where, you know, this is English is just another language. And I, I completely agree with that. I think everyone here on this uh, seminar uh, shares that sentiment. Um, and I remember in the localiz the software localization class that I took, uh, one of the videos that we watched, which was super impactful for me, was about the localization uh, project at The Witcher. And yeah. they had the same sentiment. They said, you know, we're a Polish company, but we don't, 
we don't write the game in Polish. It, 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 it's co-created, let's say. Um, yeah. But I guess my question for you is, you know, the way that our brains are wired, is that, is that, is that just idealistic or is that actually realistic to have no, you know, base language? I feel like you, does, right. does that make sense? I mean, it's, it, it seems idealistic and it's, it, it seems like a silver bullet to say that, but in practice, is it, is it possible? Yeah, uh, that's a fair question. That's a fair question. And, and to the extreme, uh, the answer would be, uh, of course, it is idealistic, it's impossible. Uh, the context of this is a game should not have an original in the sense of, in the traditional sense of original, in the traditional sense of original in the uh, religious studies uh, and translation studies sense, where the original is always uh, unique, untouchable, uh, perfect, uh, cannot be questioned, and anything that deviates from literal translation is a betrayal and a destruction of it. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it was never true, I don't think. Uh, it's even less true in video games. Video games are uh, consumer products, just like literature, really, although video games have less status. But video games are consumer products. From the point of view of the creator developer company, uh, they want to sell this thing. If they could sell the original version to everybody, hey, they would do that. And actually, for many years, that's what they did. Uh, but what happens is, as uh, markets mature, uh, that becomes less and less possible. So I don't know, would you have read, would you know about the Arabian Nights if you don't speak classic Arabic? Would you know about uh, War and Peace? if you didn't know Russian? Would you know about, I don't know, the Mahabharata if you didn't speak uh, Hindi or Punjabi? Would you know about uh, anime and roge if you didn't know uh, Japanese? Uh, would you know about Mulan if you didn't know Chinese? So the original is always there and it has a meaning for the original uh, people in the original time. But already uh, for you, speakers of English, and the way you perceive Shakespeare today is the way to Shakespearean uh, uh, people that live in during Shakespeare's life perceived it. So there's always a level of localization. Now, the good thing about video games is because they are consumer products from the get-go, uh, no one is fooling anyone, uh, that is more possible. And also the fact that the development process and the localization process now are more, are quickly one after the other. So the development uh, begins obviously um, until alpha, pre-alpha uh, is just development. Uh, you have a prototype, a functional prototype, but the moment it, it gets into production and the different levels of the games are basically locked, then that section is localized. So maybe the development the localization runs maybe a month or two or three after production, but they're running in parallel. They don't finish the whole product and then localize it. That's very rarely uh, the way they do it nowadays. It used to be, but nowadays normally the localization to all the other languages so that they can hit the market uh, global uh, release at the same time. So from that point of view, uh, the original, um, is there is the beginning of, of everything obviously and typically the original uh, will have more professionals working in that cohesion so the professionals in graphics in sound in music in dialogue the ones that are creating the menus and the caption all of these are working together when you take that to localization only a few of those lines and only a few of those professionals are going to uh, work on the localized versions but they do it uh, in parallel. So for example, if some graphics need localizing, uh, they will send the textures and the graphics to these other graphic artists in another country, in another localization company uh, or production company, and they will do those localizations. The same with songs uh, and singers, the same with uh, other type of translation. So, so, so that's then, a very long answer. 
No, no, that's that's great. And I guess just one really quick follow up question. Do you think do you think to get, you know, if you had to give a yes or no answer, do you think that we should uh, strive for that ideal solution? Or do you think that we should embrace the fact that uh, most development companies are based in a, you know, in a specific source language? Um, you know, I mean, you, yeah. you really can't do both, right? Uh, no, you can do both, but you, what, what you can do either is, um, so a typical answer from someone who does not know languages is, oh, just give me the literal translation and stop worrying about it. Well, literal translation is always wrong, basically. Uh, and you need to give the power to each uh, version, to each language specific version, uh, to make it as fun as it is uh, for a player in the US, but a player in, in India or a player in Japan or a player in Spain or a player in Italy, these localizers need to have the power, the decision power to have the last word. It cannot be the people sending the country of development, whether it's Poland or the US or Japan or Germany, that have the last say on that because they don't know that culture, they don't know that language, they don't know what people like in that place. That's what I mean, uh, is, uh, is dangerous to think of original in a traditional sense. So the co-creation side needs to be emphasized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for the question. Um, so anyone else wants to ask a question, feel free to type in the chat box or press the raise hand button. Simone. Simone, go ahead. Hello. Um, I uh, have tried a few uh, little small mo mobile games, and so I um, uh, can empathize with you know translators uh, having to work with Excel and translating strings that way. And so yeah. you know you touched on that briefly and how. Um, translating text is taken out of context and much more difficult um, and then sometimes results in you know a lower quality translation so uh -huh. do you see um, any future in the localization industry where where developers give translators more context and sort of incorporate them more into the process so they're not you know, dealing yeah. with this very difficult path using Excel strings. Yeah, 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 yeah I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there is hope there. Um, and I say that because of what I've seen in the translational localization of other media products. Um, so obviously from the point of view of the developers and the, the localization managers and the localization engineers, I, I understand the point and it's perfectly logic. The easiest thing is to take whatever needs to be translated from the game code to extract that into an excel sheet a simple small document word or excel and then email that to whomever that makes sense it's simple it's easy for them uh, but because the game has so many other uh, so much more information within the game in the gameplay as the player is going to experience it more information needs to be uh, given now the difference is going to be or is actually now when they are actually starting to implement new tools uh, where the actual translation tool localization tools is directly plugged into the game engine and the tool can call upon that particular asset in the game code so that a particular sentence animation uh, cinematic whatever can quickly be checked uh, with the login of the translator without tampering with the game code. Now, why am I hopeful? Uh, well, it's a very slow change, and although it's 2020, the game industry is still very young, and the game localization industry is super young. And the tools for the game localization industry are barely beginning. Many companies have tools that are internal, uh, and, they, and they use them with the internal teams. But looking at what has happened in the television and film industry. Uh, so we have a, a master's in audiovisual translation and we teach subtitling, voiceover, dubbing, audio description for the blind, uh, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing and localization. And for most of those, 
professional practices, nowadays we have fantastic tools. So we have a subtitling tool where you have the video, you have the original text, you have the target text, and you have everything there. You're not missing any bit of information. Everything is contained. If you're losing a tool to localize websites, same, same applies. You have a visual interface and you literally, as a translator, see exactly what the user is going to see. So those tools will, uh, suppose during this decade, come to the game localization uh, area. Some smaller companies will not have them because they're expensive, uh, but bigger companies, I think, will implement them because at the end of the day, they will save time and save money. Translators will make less errors. Localization will be possible in less time. So it will happen. It's just slow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. You don't have to agree with me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead, uh, Ahmed. Yeah, I do have a question. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miguel. Um, in your last slides, you mentioned um, two case studies, but um, I have a question about the uh, uh, trajectories of research in the uh, uh, games localization and translation studies. Um, what are the areas that you see that need more uh, research or that haven't been fully uh, uh, investigated? Right, okay. Uh, pretty much all of those, all of the areas because uh, there's very, very little academic research. So I would say at least, uh, at least uh, add variety to the language pairs that have been studied. So for example, I normally would look into uh, Spanish, English, English, Spanish. I have a functional knowledge of other European languages, French, Italian, and German, Portuguese, um, but I don't publish on those. Uh, so publish uh, academic research on other language pairs or language trios uh, would be great. So someone who does research on uh, game localization and can do the, I don't know, Japanese, uh, English, and um, Mexican, well, that'd be brilliant. Uh, or Russian and Arabic and English, that'd be fantastic. So language combinations, and then all the areas that apply to, not only to literary translation, that text translation, but that apply mostly or only to video games. So anything having to do with playability and interactivity, because that is truly unique to video games. You have problems with the translation of visual information in video games, so games change textures, right? Uh, in some cases, they change the graphics, the clothing. Uh, that's very typical. They, they may change the gore, how, how bloody that game in, is or not. Um, but yeah, anything that affects the playability, so something like the translation of riddles, of songs, uh, that could be interesting. Okay, I didn't get that about the transliteration in Russian. Uh, but yeah, there are many areas in yes. yes. Go ahead, Simon, if you want to. No, I, I was just, you mentioned Russian again, and I remember in your early slide about Bilbo Baggins, uh, you said you don't know Russian, and so I'm just letting you know that this is Bilbo Baggins. It's just an approximation transliteration for that uh, in the oh, okay. so, yeah, this, so that wouldn't mean anything to a Russian person who does not know English. No, it, it's, it just sounds like an English. Uh, name. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, so that for me, from the point of view of thinking, uh, knowing what Tolkien thought, that would have been a mistake because Tolkien was very fully aware of his names, uh, first names and family names, and he constructed them in a way that uh, part of it would be translated, part of it would not. Um, it's, it's always a beautiful headache. But that's the translation of name is pervasive. It exists in any translation. Uh, the translation of uh, interactivity, the translation of graphics and interactive music is unique to games. More questions? Wing. Go ahead, Wing. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> hello. Um, well, first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I'm interested in um, playability as 
a quality of, as a criteria to measure the quality of video games. And yeah. I believe in maybe one of your works you suggested a simple formula to measure yeah. playability in localized games. And yeah. I was wondering because I think back um, in that I, I can't I can't really remember it that clearly, but I think you have divided them into different layers. I think written yes. language and also sound and such. But yes. I was wondering if um, if written language is also just one of the um, let's say category <laughs> categories, and is it weighted the same as all the other ones? Because if I look back on the presentation today. If, right. for example, in the riddle, like the, the riddle person, if the riddle is translated wrong, it has a very big impact on the game. And right, that, right. Do you still think the weight should be the same? Uh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Uh, so um, you could, uh, you probably should, because, okay, however rich media may be rich, still most of it, and although a lot of people say, "Oh, we are a visual, uh, we're a visual species. We we do everything through our eyes," I would tend to kind of disagree. I think um, we do mostly things through our language, um, but it's, it's a difficult topic. Anyway, uh, you're right. So that formula it was the semiotic layers, uh, those eight layers, and the weighting of each layer uh, would would depend on how complex that particular layer is. So if a game is very rich in text, uh, because it does a lot of, I don't know, imagine it does a lot of wordplay, it does a lot of idiosyncratic uh, mannerisms for different characters, playing with the phonetics, the pronunciation, playing with the spelling, with the syntax, then probably the language uh, category, the language layer, semiotic layer, you would want to divide that in subsections. Uh, so syntax, phonetics, uh, morphology, whatever, and then assign values to them. Um, then if, if a game is more uh, visual or if a game is very uh, musical, then you will want to do that with those layers. Uh, but yeah, I think that actually words have a lot of, they have a lot of bearing on us. They imagine, so okay, how many people watch television with no sound? no one literally zero now how many people listen to the radio with no image everybody billions of people around the world through the ages so i would say we are more linguistic and that's because our unique invention of language is just beautiful right i would always say language is the best invention of the human species and will always be because we can get through so much uh, so yeah, that in that analysis of quality, and I'm happy for you to contact me about it, uh, I would subdivide that in the different layers depending on the particular game. Uh, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Be shy. Okay, I guess, yeah, I guess that would be, that would be it for today um, because we're running out of time. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Miguel, for being with us today. And um, before, um, before I leave you all, um, just make some um, quick uh, PSAs on um, uh, the colloquium will continue um, holding um, different sessions in the upcoming uh, weeks and days. So on the next, uh, so the next session will be on February 26th. Um, with Janice John Pan um, talking about, um, uh, oh, basically the topic is from uh, Corpus Basic Interpreting Studies, so interpreting data mining. Um, and then that will be on February 26th. And uh, March 19th, we'll have uh, Hannah Risco talking about rethinking translation expertise, a workplace perspective. Um, so um, I would like to thank Dr. Miguel for uh, graciously uh, coming today and give us this interesting talk. Um, for us, uh, students of translation studies, um, it was really informative in exploring other dimensions of translation studies uh, that is, uh, really has been explored. And uh, the input that Dr. Miguel gave us today probably will generate a lot of ideas 
among the student body for uh, for the research topic or uh, papers that we will write in the future. So uh, I would like to end the session and thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Naif. Thank you uh, for your question. Thank you. Take care.